Hi, good afternoon. I'm Jane Daly. I teach American history at the University of Chicago, and I don't want to take up uh, too much time introducing our panelists because each of them is so accomplished that it would take most of our, our time just to, to speak about all the things they've done. I will say that Professor Danielle Allen uh, is a member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. She was formerly a member of the faculty at the University of Chicago, and we miss her very much. She is a classicist and a political theorist who has written broadly on questions of justice and democracy and equality. The book we're discussing uh, today is In Defense of Equality. This one, right? Our Declaration. Our de oh, there it is, sorry. <laughs> Our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality. Uh, that, and that's going to be published just at the end of this month uh, by, by Norton. We also have with us Professor Joseph Ellis, um, who is a noted biographer of our founding fathers, historian of the revolutionary era. He's written prize-winning books on Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. He is, uh, for many years, professor at Holyoke, Mount Holyoke College, and now he is a uh, professor at uh, the Commonwealth, sorry, Commonwealth Honors College of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And we're going to talk about his new book today that was published in 2013 uh, by Knopf. And that book is Revolutionary Summer, The Birth of American Independence. Uh, so I'd like to start out, we have, we have here uh, a philosopher and a historian. And they take different uh, approaches, both to our founding documents, our texts, and also to the stories that they tell. So I wanted to begin um, with Danielle. You say at one point um, in the book that history can function as a barrier to entry uh, for some people trying to understand uh, texts and, and ideas. And I wonder if you could uh, elaborate on that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, thanks so much, and thank you to Printers Row for having me. It's wonderful to be here and be back in Chicago. I should say one of my favorite places on earth. I feel good every time I land in O'Hare, so it's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, I've written a book about the Declaration of Independence. Um, as Jane said, it's called Our Declaration, and I believe there should be copies here, even though it's not officially out till the end of June. Um, but I wrote that book from the perspective of a philosopher wanting to make the case that the Declaration does, in fact, make a coherent philosophical argument about political equality. The hard thing about doing that is that one has to figure out how to bring ideas to life and show that there is drama in ideas. Ideas shape our world, and so the ways in which they come to be in a context like the Revolutionary Summer um, is critical to our, all of our self-understanding about democracy and citizenship. But my experience of other books about the Declaration, where the goal had been to talk about the ideas, is that people tend to want to give the history of where did this concept um, of happiness come from, that is to say, what earlier philosophers had written about it, um, or where did this concept of nation come from, what had earlier philosophers said. And for a person who hasn't been exposed to that earlier tradition to make their way through that, a book of that kind is just very hard. You have to have read a lot in order then to understand the meaning of the Declaration. And my view about philosophy is one needs that history, one needs to understand it, yes, as a scholar, but language itself is already an incredibly rich resource for understanding the structure of an argument. So in my book, I really bear down on the text of the Declaration and do my best to use the language of the text itself to open up the arguments of the Declaration and show their philosophic structure. And that, the idea was to try to bring readers in for whom sort of too many references to Locke and Shaftesbury and Hume and things like that would, um, would make it just too hard as a starting point. So after my book, I said, go read Gary Wills and learn about Locke and Hume and Shaftesbury. But read my book first. Hutchison. Hutchison, exactly. Yeah. Um, and historians are mostly interested in, oh, excuse me. Historians are mostly interested in, if philosophers are interested in text, historians are interested in contexts and the context in which, in this case, the Declaration was written. Though the book I'm trying to peddle here, and by the way, this is an unveiled uh, attempt to sell this book. I have one more child in college, and every, every penny that you contribute to me will go right into the Alexander Ellis Scholarship Fund. And, um, but um, let me try to engage Danielle here for a second. I have read Danielle's book, and I urge you to read it. I think that 
there was reinterpretation of the Declaration by Lincoln in 1863 at Gettysburg. There was a reinterpretation of the meaning of those words by Martin Luther King on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in August of 1963. I think that Danielle's reinterpretation is the next step in that expansive tradition of what those words mean. Most especially, all men are created equal, though they are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are the biggies. Now, there's some that come after that that she thinks are big, too. Um, this woman has written the interpretation of Jefferson's words for our time. Did Jefferson mean those words as she reads them? No. <laughs> Especially on race. I think you can read his words. Because Jefferson switched the Lockean term from like, liberty, and property to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, he got the phrase pursuit of happiness from George Mason, who used it in the preamble to the Virginia Declaration, which was being written at that time and published in the Pennsylvania packet the very week he was writing these words. He, so changing property is a big deal because property is going to be the main way Southern planters interpret the Declaration as a defense of slavery. So I go with that. But Jefferson did not believe that black people or African American people were equal to whites. And he believed they were unequal not because of culture or nurture, but because of biology or nature. He believed they could never be equal. And there are some really unpleasant letters that you will not like to read, in which Jefferson gets a, a, a piece of poetry from Phyllis Wheatley and it, it says, uh, she didn't really write this. Couldn't believe a black woman would do it. Or in 1806, he exchanges a letter with another Virginia planter who says, you know, I need to figure out how we're going to think about mixed race slaves and black, free blacks. And Jefferson wrote him back and said, half and half, it's still black. Three quarters, it's still black. Sally Hemings is three quarters. Seven eighths, all his children by Sally Hemings are seven eighths. The blood clears. So, can I, yeah, Jeff, thanks, Jane. Um, so much to say, no question about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, first of all, for, Joe to have said that about my book is an extraordinary thing, so thank you. That's remarkable, and I appreciate it. Um, there's no question about Jefferson's views about race. I mean, Joe's quite right that that's what they were. And for me, one of the most important features of working on the Declaration was to discover how many voices contributed to its construction. And so what I would say about that issue, and actually specifically about the pursuit of happiness phrase, is that it's not Jefferson who deserves credit for that phrase, but John Adams, your other guy. He's my guy. He's your guy. And let me just tell that story, because it's pretty important, actually. So Adams does not get enough credit for the Declaration. In the fall of 1775, he and Richard Henry Lee, a Virginian, put their heads together, they collaborated. They were both already radicals at this point. They knew they wanted independence, but the question was how to do it. They came up with a strategy. And the strategy was show everybody in the colonies that given that the king had ruled them out of their protection, they could no longer function as the king's magistrates. They couldn't simultaneously be his representatives and be out of his protection. Consequently, anarchy was as good as the established order of the day in the colonies, and therefore it was incumbent on the colonies to start building their own new governments. As a part of a committee in Continental Congress, they recommended in November that New Hampshire, whose governor had fled, write a constitution. New Hampshire did that, delivered it January of 1776. They began working to get all of the colonies to start building constitutions. But then their question was, how should a colony build a constitution? Lee turned to Adams for advice on that. Adams wrote him a letter in November that was then re reproduced in a fuller form as a pamphlet that spring called Thoughts on Government. In that letter and in that pamphlet, Adams argues that the point of government is happiness, achieving happiness for the individual and for the collective body. 
Over the course of that year, he was working on driving that point home. Mason, it's true, uses the word happiness, although I don't